This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the second video for Unit 5 on the skeletal system. In this video, I'll be going over the important bones of the human skeleton that I expect you to know the names of so that we can talk about our bones in something with a little more specificity than the neck bone or the leg bone or the hand bone. There are two divisions to the skeleton. There is the axial skeleton, which is outlined in blue or sort of blue on this diagram. And in the axial skeleton, you can see we've got the skull, the thoracic cage or the rib cage, and the vertebral column. The appendicular skeleton contains your appendages and the various girdles that connect them to the axial skeleton, the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. So looking first at the axial skeleton, we'll start at the top with the skull. There are 29 bones in the skull, you won't need to know all of them, and one movable joint. I see I lost my T here. Most of these bones are flat or irregular in shape, and you have some sutural bones as well. The interesting thing about the bones of the skull is, is that sometimes people develop what are known as wormian bones, which are just small sutural bones. Often these are connected to a particular disease state. There are three major parts of the skull that we're going to be talking about. We'll be talking first about the cranium or the brain box. Then we'll be talking about the face, the many, many bones involved in the face. And then third, the jaw. You also have the three inner ear bones that we'll cover when we talk about the senses. And there is a small bone directly below your uh, jaw bone known as the hyloid bone. If you are a fan of detective stories, you may already know that this is a tiny little bone that helps provide articulation for the, your tongue, and it will be easily broken if someone is strangled. So it's one of those things that you read about in mystery stories about uh, forensic anthropologists checking out to see is the hyloid bone broken. So what are the key bones of the cranium? You need to know all of these bones. Starting at the back of your head, you have your occipital bone the very, very back of your head. Then you have the parietal bones. There actually are two of these. There's a suture right down the top of your skull, but we can't really see it on this diagram. The frontal bone, your forehead. The temporal bone, again, there are two, one on each side, and this is where your ear is, so that the tiny bits of the inner ear are found in the temporal bone. The ethmoid bone which is seen just through the eye socket here. It provides the top of the nasal cavities and some of the base of the brain, the base of the brain, sorry. And the sphenoid bone, which we see here in purple, which again goes across the entire floor of the brain over to the other side. So actually there's bones all along the bottom here. Your brain is completely encased. A monomic for remembering all these bones that I found on the web is old people from Texas eat spiders. And you can see that takes the first letter of each of these bones. So if you want to use that monomic, you can. Moving on to the bones of the face, there are many bones involved in your face. You do not need to know all of them. The ones that I would like you to know, there's four bones that I want you to be sure that you can recognize. Starting here with the front of your face, thinking about um, where your, your upper jaw connects to the bone that runs down below your nose. That is the maxilla bone, and there actually are two maxilla bones that come together here just below your nose. The bones that provide your cheekbones, if you have beautiful cheekbones, are your zygomatic bones, and again, there are two of them. The bone that provides the bridge of your nose. Most of your nose is cartilage, but it does have a bone that it, it starts off with, and that's your nasal bone. And then your jaw bone, the only bone on your face that moves, is your mandible. So those four bones you do need to know. They're all ones that you can feel, feeling your face using yourself as an anatomy project. But there are other small bones as well. So just to go over some of those, another bone that gives you shape to your eye socket or your eye orb orbital is the lacrimal bone, and through the lacrimal bone comes the lacrimal, lacrimal ducts, which carry your tears. Dividing your nose is a flat, thin bone that's actually a little bit bigger than you can see on this picture, called the vomer. 
and inside your nose there are also irregular shaped scroll like conchi or conche for the plural. Some of these conchi actually come from the ethmoid bone. If you look, here's a little bit of light pink, and this light pink conchi here is connected to that. And the ethmoid bone, if you remember, is part of the base of the brain, so the floor of the cranium there. Then the last bone of the face, we can't see at all from this diagram. You know, I hope, that the inside of your mouth, you have the roof of your mouth, and that's also known as your palate, and it is hard in the front and then soft in the back. The anterior portion of the hard palate is actually provided by the maxilla bone, but the posterior portion of the hard palate is your palatine bones. If you want to memorize this whole list of facial bones, I found a monomic that suggested you use Virgil cannot make my pet zebra laugh as a way to keep track of all those facial bones. Not shown on this diagram are your sinuses. You have cavities in your bones of your skull. There's some here and down below over here and many little ones in between and there's one in the temporal bone which we can't really show. These cavities make themselves known when you have a cold or an allergy attack because they may fill up with fluids and give you pain. But they are also there to provide uh, a means of lightening the weight of the skull bone by taking out some of the uh, heart, you know, the heavy bone and putting in air space, which is lighter than bone. And they also contribute to the sound of your voice and your singing voice because they are resonating chambers. When you strike a note, air vibrates throughout your um, respiratory passages, but also in your face. And so your sinuses help provide the sound of a beautiful singing voice. Now we'll move down to the thoracic cage or the rib cage. The rib cage is attached to your vertebral column in the back and to the sternum or breastbone in the front. The sternum has three parts. You have the manubrium up top, the body of the sternum in the middle, and if you took the CPR class, you were bouncing up and down on the body of the sternum. And then there's a little piece that actually is cartilage, not bone, at the end, known as the zipphoid process. A process is a sticking out part, and so we see how it sticks out at the bottom of the, the um, sternum. So in your thoracic cage, and of course this is protecting your heart and your lungs, there are 12 pairs of ribs, and the first seven, if you can notice here, the first seven connect directly to the sternum. They go through a piece of cartilage. Here's some hyaline cartilage again, what very flexible cartilage, strong and flexible, necessary in your ribs to allow your rib cage to expand when you take a breath. And so these first seven pairs of ribs are known as true ribs because they do connect directly to the sternum. Then below that you have three false ribs which connect to cartilage, which connects to other cartilage that connects to the sternum. So they do not directly connect to the sternum. That is why they are known as false ribs. And then you have two pairs of floating ribs down at the very bottom that don't even make it all the way around. And so they're uh, called floating ribs because they don't connect to anything. And then we get to the vertebral column itself. In your vertebral column, you have seven cervical vertebrae connected to your head or your neck. Then you have 12 thoracic vertebrae because you have 12 ribs in your thoracic cage. So you have to have one vertebrae to connect to each rib. Then you have five lumbar vertebrae. And then at the bottom, there is some vertebrae that, that have been fused together, five fused together to make the sacrum, and then four to five fused together at the very end to be the coccyx. Some people remember the uh, three parts of the vertebral column in thinking about eating your food, that at 7 o'clock in the morning you eat breakfast, and at 12 noon you eat lunch, and at 5 p.m. you eat supper, and those times, 7, 12, and 5, neatly correspond to how many vertebrae you have in each of those sections of your vertebral column. The cervical vertebrae, the first two, are a very interesting shape. These vertebrae allow your head to turn, to pivot. The first vertebrae is known actually as the atlas, and it basically looks more or less like a um, lifesaver. It's really just a ring. And the second cervical vertebrae is the axis, 
and it has a large point in the, this is kind of looking from the side then, um, sticking up that the first cervical vertebrae fits over. So actually you have a very different shape of your first cervical vertebrae and this allows your head to have the range of motion that it has. You can also see that within the vertebral column there are some curves. The cervical vertebrae curves forward, the thoracic vertebrae curve backwards, the lumbar vertebrae curve forward again, and the sacral and coccyx curve backwards. This is the natural state of things. There is a natural curvature of the spine, and that ends up putting your head in the center of your body, center of gravity, and so that allows a more comfortable and balanced position for your head to have your spine have these curves. The intervertebral discs is cartilage, not hyaline cartilage this time, but fibrous cartilage, which is tougher. It provides shock absorption, um, some protection there, and also some flexibility. You know that you can move your spine in several different directions. The honors students need to know a little bit more about the vertebrae and the differences. Here is sort of a, the going over the general parts of a vertebrae. This actually is one of the lumbar vertebrae, so this would be down here in this part of the body. All vertebrae have a, a spool-like part. Of course, we're looking at this from a superior position. We're looking down on it from the top. Uh, if we looked from the side, we would see this as sort of thick uh, vertical body here, and then you've got various irregularities over here. So the vertebral body, or the centrum, is a spool-like uh, supportive structure, and then from that you have a hole, and all holes in the body are known as foramens. So the foramen, this is the hole, of course, for your spinal cord to come through. And then this is a reg an irregular bone, so of course there are things that stick out. So the things that stick out to the side are known as transverse processes, process being something that sticks out, and of course to the side, transverse. And the one that sticks out posteri posteriorly is your spinous process. And you can see from this diagram that they, the spinous process generally points down in a more downward direction. It's not going straight out. The spinous process is what you can feel as bumps along your spine. If you feel along your backbone, you are feeling the various tips of your the various spinous processes as you move down. There are various facets, which are parts of the bone that have been lined with cartilage, primarily hyaline cartilage again. And this is where one vertebrae or a vertebrae and a rib are articulating, where they are coming together. And of course, you have cartilage in those joints to provide smooth movement without pain of one bone against another. So as you move down the vertebral column, the vertebrae change shape. And you can tell where a vertebrae comes from if you know a little bit about these shapes. Starting at the top with the cervical vertebrae, what's distinct about them, and here we go, here's again the body or the centrum, and you have some small transverse processes and a small spinous process. But you see we have these additional foramens off to the side, and that is because we have arteries traveling through the cervical vertebrae to get blood to the brain. So the foramens, holes in bones, are to allow blood vessels and nerves to travel through, so the um, big verte vertebral foramen is for your spinal cord, for a nerve, but in your cervical vertebrae you also have the two um, transverse processes which are for blood vessels, for arteries to get to the brain. The thoracic vertebrae, you can see we don't have those transverse foramens anymore. There's no need for blood vessels to, to go through them. There's plenty of blood vessels around them though. What's unique about the thoracic vertebrae is that we have the ribs attaching on each one of these vertebrae, so we have little facets on the end of the transverse process for a good articulation with each of the pairs of ribs. And then the lumbar, <coughs> the lumbar vertebrae, which are down here at the base of your vertebral column, they are carrying the weight of everything above it. So not only do you have the vertebrae, but you have all of those internal organs, the trunk of the body, um, the upper extremities going through the shoulder down onto the vertebral column. So these lumbar vertebrae are carrying a lot of weight. They're the bottom people on the pyramid, um, so they need to be strong. And so their body section, the centrum section, is much larger because of the extra weight that's being carried. 
Let's move on now to the appendicular skeleton. We'll start at the top with the pectoral girdle, and girdle is just referring to several bones working together to hold up um, the extremities. So the pectoral girdle anchors and supports the upper extremities, or what we more commonly call the arm, and they provide attachment in various processes, you know, parts of the bones that are sticking out for many, many muscles. The range of motion that is possible with the arm is the greatest in the body. You think about what you can do with your arms. You can put your hands down at your side. You can touch your hands directly over your head, straight in front of your body, or you should be able to get pretty close to being touching them straight behind. Maybe you can't raise them up over your head, but you can make circles of your hands to the sides, to the front. There is a great deal of range of motion, and because of that, there are a great deal of different muscles pulling those bones in different directions. So there are many attachment sites for muscles on your pectoral girdle. So the two bones of your pectoral girdle are your scapula, or your shoulder blade, and your clavicle, or your collarbone. The depression where the head of the humerus fits in to allow all this range of motion is known as the glenoid fossa. The um, bulk of the muscle attachments is on the scapula and the, the glenoid fossa is there, but the clavicle is very important because it provides additional support against uh, too uh, flexible of a shoulder, too loose. So it's providing something to push against in the, towards the anterior position and just really helps stabilize the entire joint. Moving on now to your upper extremity or your arm. The big long bone at the top is the humerus. And then there are two bones in your forearm, the radius and the ulna. The ulna is your elbow, and it is the one that is directly connected. You can see here we've got a, um, both in a diagram and then in the x-ray, you can see it is the ulna that articulates directly with the humerus. And the bone that you see right here is what is your elbow. The radius articulates with the ulna. So again, on, down here on this particular drawing, here is your ulna, and it's articulating directly with the humerus, and then the radius is articulating with the ulna at the top here. What is interesting about the bones in your forearm is that the radius can then move over the ulna and allow you to turn your hand over or to pronate your hand. So here in this particular the first diagram, the hand is in the supine position. The thumb is pointing to the outside. The, 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 um, this would be the center of the body uh, over here by the pinky. You know, this is the person's body. And, and then they're able to rotate the hand over, to pronate it, put the thumb, instead of moving it in a medial direction, taking it Medially, medially, and you'll see how the radius has flipped over the ulna. So that's what allows your hand to turn over to pronate and supinate, and it is because of the way the radius articulates with the ulna. The bones of the hand, which I'll show you on a separate slide, there are many small bones in your hand, and you won't have to know the names for those, um, but they're carpals and metacarpals and phalanges. So moving on to the hand, you have eight small bones in your wrist, eight small carpals. They all have names, but you don't need to know them. Then there are five metacarpals. You can see these are, even though they're not very long, they're actually long bones because they are taller than they are wide. And so this forms the palm of your hand where the metacarpals are found. And then the phalanges make up your fingers. And your thumb has just two phalanges, the rest of your fingers have three. We number these digits. Your thumb is always one. So to talk about these medically, we would talk about the first digit, the fourth digit, etc. And when it comes to the phalanges, they are known as proximal or middle or distal. So you can talk about this particular phalange, phalanx, which is on the fourth digit, and it's the middle phalanx, which is the singular form of phalanges. So you just need to know that, that carpals refer to wrist, and you have eight carpal bones. Then you have metacarpal bones that make up the palm of your hand, and phalanges that make up your fingers. 
When we get into joints, we'll talk about how the joints between the phalanges are hinge joints. Hinge joints. They just open or close. But the joints over here between the um, proximal phalange, phalanx and the metacarpal is not a hinge joint. It's a condyloid joint. It allows a little bit more motion. Moving down your body to the pelvic girdle, you have a big, strong support system because it's providing anchorage and support to lower extremities and also is supporting all of the body above it. Of course, your pelvic bones, pelvic girdle provides some protection for the various organs in the pelvic cavity as well. And when we're talking about the pelvic girdle, we're really not talking about the sacrum here, um, but when you're talking about support, you have to have that included in there to provide the connection for the supporting the upper body. The pelvic girdle or the hips can also be called the ossa coxae. And there are three bones that eventually fuse by the time you are done growing to form the coxae or the coxa if we're talking about one of them. You have the ilium, which is the top part, the crest of the hip. The ischium, which is what you sit on, your sitting bones or your ischium, and then the pubis, the very, very front piece. And part of all three is this depression known as the acetabulum, and that is where your hip bone, I mean, your, the hip will connect with the femur. So this, on this diagram, the acetabulum is shown here. The two pubis bones come together and are connected by cartilage, at the symphysis pubis. And they're the largest foramen in the human body is found here in the connection between the ischium and the pubis, and that's known as the obturator foramen. We've got a lot of nerves and blood vessels traveling from the trunk of the body down to the lower extremities through the obturator foramen. So now moving down to your lower extremity, you've got the largest bone in the human body, the femur, the thigh bone. Here at the top is the head of the femur, the ball part of the ball and socket joint. This attaches into the acetabulum that I just talked about. Then you have the tibia. The tibia is your shin bone. It is the big thick bone running down the front of your leg. And the fibula runs down beside it. And I saw one monomic that suggested that if you think tibula and fibula like tuba and flute, it will help you remember that the tibia is a big thick bone and the fibula is the smaller bone. The tibia actually provides our inner ankle bump and the fibula provides the outer ankle bump. Along with these three long bones, you have the sesamoid bone, which is your kneecap. And here's just, this is a side view showing that uh, the bone floating in space that actually would be encased in various ligaments and tendons. And then this is just a closer view of the, um, a close-up of the joint at the femur. Similarly to the hand, the bones of the foot, you'll just need to know general categories. They're not called carpals, but they're called tarsals when we get to your foot. So here's a close-up of a foot. The um, tarsal bones are making up the ankle portion, or the very, very top of your foot, and the talus is the bone that articulates with the tibia. So the tibia connects to the talus, and it's known as the true ankle bone. Calcaneus is your heel bone, and it connects to the talus, providing stability to the back of your foot. Then you have your metal, or sorry, your metatarsals. They're down here, putting my brackets in the wrong place. The metatarsals, which provide the, the ball of your foot, and you can probably on your feet sort of see where those bones are. And then you have the phalanges again. And like the hand, you four of your toes have three phalanges each, but your big toe only has two, like the thumb. They are numbered just like your hand, starting out with the toe, not the thumb. And so there are four, there are five, sorry, digits. And so if you talk about any of the phalanges on your toes, you use the same directional words, proximal, middle, and distal, as you did for the hand. 
Honor students need to be able to distinguish between male and female pelvises. And again, if you are into forensic anthropology or murder mysteries, you probably have picked up some of this information. There are clear differences that can be seen between the two uh, genders, male and female pelvises. So this top pelvis you can see is wider than it is tall. And the bottom pelvis it has more height than it has width. The top pelvis has a broader angle between the, in the pubic arch here so that it is greater than 90 degrees and the bottom pelvis would be less than 90 degrees in the pubic arch. And then the central opening, this is going around the pelvic brim, you can see it's slightly larger in this pelvis that's on top. What you can't see from this particular angle of drawing is just how the sacrum fits in there is a little bit of a difference in how it curves along the backside of the pelvis. So if you haven't figured it out, this is the female pelvis here. It is wide, it has more space um, for the baby to develop and to be born, and then the male pelvis down below where we're not worried about having a baby come through this opening on its way out to join us in the world. There are a few age-related changes that are specific to bones. There'll be more information coming on age-related changes on the video on joints. You have until about age 30 to set yourself up with good, strong bones. So you still have a number of years to do this, and I encourage you to eat right and exercise. You build your bones by having a diet that is rich in the minerals that you need, by receiving enough vitamin D, either by drinking fortified milk or eating um, certain varieties of fish or getting 15 minutes of sunshine a day. So you're laying down and strengthening your bones, or also by weight-bearing exercise. I need to make sure I say that. But you're, you're strengthening your bones up until about age 30. And then after that point, it is all downhill. And how fast you go downhill into having fragile bones depends some extent on genetics, but it definitely also depends on how strong your bones were when you got to that strongest point. So after age 30, we see the osteoclasts outnumbering the osteoblasts. So the bone-destroying, if you want to say it that way, cells are in greater number than the bone-building cells. Overall, we see calcium levels falling in the bones. Part of that is due to nutrient malabsorption that tends to increase with age. Um, we just start breaking down and are not as good at getting the nutrients out of, fo out of food. And then, of course, if you slow down your activity level and don't engage in as many weight-bearing activities, you also can see calcium levels fall as bones thin out in response to not having, to, not the, no, having no stress put on them. So as an end result, bones become brittle. And the spongy bone, since it, there's less of it, um, just, you know, on an area space-by-space space comparison, it will weaken faster before compact compact bone. And remember that spongy bone, even though it has all those holes in it, is providing strength for stress coming from multiple directions. It's like the trusses in your house or the bridge. It's not just up and down stress, but it's stress from the side. Bone loss becomes much more rapid after menopause for women, and so women are at greater risk for bone problems all along. But men are not exempt. Um, maybe it hits them a little bit later. They have to be a little bit older before they start seeing some of these issues, but both men and women can experience hip fractures. And if it's a hip fracture due to brittle bones, what happens is as a person is standing, the bone breaks and then they fall. It's not a case of them falling and breaking a hip, but it's a case of the hip breaks and then they fall. You also see in older, the older population vertebral compression fractures, which lead to a decrease in height or the curvature of the spine, which is commonly known as dowager's hump. So that there are a number of things that happen to your skeleton as you age, but if you take time before you kind of hit this point of no return at age 30 and try to build a strong skeleton, you will reap the benefits later on in life. So that finishes this brief overview of the human skeleton. Make sure you know the names of the bones as we, that have been outlined in this video because we will be talking about them as we move through the rest of the human organs.